We're live. So welcome everyone. Bienvenidos, bonjour, happy spring and happy poetry month. It's so wonderful to welcome you all today for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry and our Sunday special with the ever relevant and certainly resilient Slappering Hall Press, uh, publishers of chapbooks and anthologies extraordinaire since 1990. Well, I'm your host, Sandy Anone. I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. Again, I thank you for joining us today from my kitchen here in Olympia, Washington, and everyone else in their squares from wherever they are joining us from for uh, our live broadcast today, live in Zoom, and also those of us watching live on Facebook. The chats are live, so please send the love. And two of you today in our live chats will be receiving this week's gratitude gift courtesy of Slappering Hall Press. So make sure that you keep those chats coming. Well, before I introduce our Sunday special guests, just a little bit about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Cultivating Voices Live Poetry began on March 29th, 2020 in response to the shutdowns of in-person venues everywhere and has developed into an international, intersectional, intergenerational reading series and poetry community now with approaching 2,600 members worldwide. We alternate weekly readings between our ever popular new book showcase, our poets focused readings with a theme and a live open mic and our occasional special event like today's Sunday special with the poets of Slappering Hall Press. Well, now to today's program. It is just honestly my very distinct pleasure to uh, welcome Slappering Hall Press and poet and founder of the Hudson Valley Writers Center and founding and current editor of Slappering Hall Press, Margot Tapstever, to talk a little bit about the press before before we hear from some of the poets. And I wanted to just say thank you. You're getting the accolades and applause that you should for this very visionary endeavor that you undertook decades ago and that, that highlights and elevates and amplifies uh, emerging writers and the beautiful art of chapbook of that, that is the chapbook. Uh, I, I, really, I really admire what you have done and it is such an honor and pleasure to have you with us today, Margo. Thank you so much, Sandy. And also thank you, Don. Um, I think highly, so highly of both of your poetry and I've known Don since the 1960s. We took a workshop with Denise Levertoff which was a formative experience for both of us and changed our lives. Um, but thank you for organizing this wonderful series. And thanks to everyone for attending. We're, we're excited to talk about Slappering All Press, especially during National Poetry Month. I'll say a few words about the history and the Slappering All Press chapbook competition. And, and Jennifer will talk about the conversation series. And Sally Lewis Dunn, longtime member of the Slappering Hall Press Advisory Committee, will talk. And Aaron Cicado Kamura, last year's SHP chapbook contest winner, will also speak about his experiences with the press, and the four of us will read some of our poems. Slappering All Press is one of the oldest chapbook presses in the United States. Since 1990, it has published them, and everyone probably knows that a chapbook is a short collection of poetry. The mission of Slappering Hall Press is to advance the national and international conversation of poetry and poetics, <clears throat> principally by publishing and supporting the work of emerging poets. For a poet, a chapbook can serve as a stepping stone to publishing with an established press. In 1989, with three other founding board members, poet Patricia Farwell, 
Don Stever and Nick Robinson, I established the Hudson Valley Writers' Center. It grew out of the Sleepy Hollow poetry series that I had started in, a, in the Warner Library in 1983. For several years, the organization was run out of the Stever's attic with events at churches, community centers, universities, and libraries. In 1989, I also founded Slapping Hall Press and we launched its first publication, the anthology Voices from the River. Slapping Hall is an iteration of Old Dutch for Sleepy Hollow. With its simple and elegant design, which featured established and soon to become luminaries such as Hayden Carruth, Jean Valentine, Dana Joya, Stephen Dunn, Toy Daracott, and Billy Collins, the, that chapbook set a high aesthetic and literary standard. Billy Collins actually taught for us and he actually taught in a church and um, it was, he was um, one of our workshop teachers at the beginning. After its inaugural publication, Slappering Hall Press co-editor Stephanie Strickland and I focused the mission of the press on publishing emerging poets. Since 1990, SHP has conducted a yearly and anonymously judged national competition for the publication of a chapbook by a poet who has not previously published in book form. Many of the winning SHP poets have gone on to publish additional chapbooks and full length collections and to become notable members of the literary community. In 2004, after poet Stephanie Strickland retired as co-editor and she served for several decades, I created the SHP Advisory Committee which consists of respected published poets, such as Sally Bloomis Dunn, who will be talking with you, some with expertise in small presses and teaching. Poets Mervyn Taylor, Peggy Ellsberg, Jennifer Franklin, and I serve as the current SHP co-editors. Many SHP authors have accomplished remarkable achievements in the literary field, and I would like to tell you about all of them. But in the interest of brevity, I invite you to visit the Hudson Valley Writers Center Slappering Hall Press website which is www.writerscenter.org to and read about all of the amazing authors and their publications. You can also find information about the SHV, SHP readings and Jennifer Franklin is the program director of the Writer Center and has established a stunning reading series. And actually there's a reading she can tell you about coming up on Wednesday and just amazing readings on a monthly basis. basis. And you'll also find workshops and guidelines for the chapbook contest. Slappering Hall Press has published several anthologies and special publications. For instance, in 2014, SHP published the debut box set of seven new African poets. And this is what it looks like, if you can see it, I hope you can. Um, and they, they, they include TJ Dima, Clifton Gachagua, CC Jaji, Nick Makoa, Ladam Osman, Warsan Shire, Len Verve, and it's edited by Kwame Das and Chris Albani. And, the, and we did published in collaboration with Perry Schooner and the Poetry Foundation Poets in the World series. Ilya Kaminsky was the series co -edit, series co editor. And uh, Jennifer is going to take over now and, and say a few words about the press. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Margot, um, for that uh, introduction. Um, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Don. Thank you all for being here today to hear about Suffering Hall Press and to hear us read some of our poems. Um, as Margot said, uh, I was going to talk to you a little bit about um, the Suffering Hall Press conversation chapbook series. It amplifies established and emerging women poets with each of its seven titles so far. We featured Elizabeth Alexander before she was Obama's inaugural poet with the Cornell University professor, Lyra Van Cleef Stefanon. And our second book was Star of Pitt Poets, Denise Duhamel with Amy Lemon. Then former Poetry Society of America's uh, Molly Peacock with Amy M. Clark, then Kim Adnizio and Stegner Fellow and Barnard Prize winner, Brittany Purim. Um, then we had Kimiko Han with poet and social justice activist, Tamiko Bayer, who has just come out with her, her new full-length collection with Alice James Press. 
And then we came full circle and asked Lyra Van Clough Stefanon to be the master woman poet. And she chose one of her recently graduated um, undergrads from Cornell, Lila Chantrell, for their chapbook. And finally, Cave Canem co founder Toy Derricott chose the poet and essayist Dawn Lundy Martin to do the conversation chapbook with her. So if none of you have seen these chapbooks, um, they're very beautiful. This is our most recent one. And this is the one by Toy Derricott and Dawn Lundy Martin. It's called A Bruise is a Figure of Remembrance. And Ed Rayer is um, the designer of all of our chapbooks. And he does a beautiful job doing letterpress covers and hand stitching them. And I'm not sure if you can, if you can easily see this. Um, you can probably see it better with Aaron. He will show you when he reads, but they're hand stitched. And that's our most recent book. You can get these titles on our website in the Slappering Hall Press bookstore. Um, we're not quite sure yet who our next conversation duo will be, but we will certainly keep all of you posted on that. Um, of the 14 poets in the series, we're very proud that eight are, are poets of color and five are LGBTQ poets. In order to get a more diverse submission pool for our annual Emerging Writers Chapel competition, we now offer free submissions to all BIPOC poets. And this is an initiative that we really hope will bring in a lot of um, new voices to our, our Slappering Hall Press contest. Um, it's due on June 15th. So we hope that if you have a chapbook collection that you have been working on and you've never published a book or a chapbook, we would love to read your work. Um, so please do look up the guidelines and, and send your work to us before June 15th. Thank you all. Thank you, Margo, and thank you, Jennifer. I, I really appreciate you living in action, the uh, putting into action the spirit of your mission um, and uh, what fantastic work. Uh, I actually, Kim Portson, Parsons and I actually met at the University of Nebraska and I was an editorial assistant at Prairie Schooner. So I will, under Hilda Raz, of course, not Kwame Daz, uh, I'm older than that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to um, getting, that, getting that chapbook series. What extraordinary work, thank you. Well, now we get the beautiful pleasure of having um, heard this history firsthand. And of course your invitation to submit uh, your chapbook manuscripts to Slappering Hall Press, we now get to hear some poetry. So <laughs> um, I am extraordinarily excited to um, introduce first um, Aaron Casado Kimura, whom I learned today lives in my uh, my hometown that I grew up in until I was 12 years old. Uh, Aaron is the author of the chapbook Uba Sute from Slappering Hall Press, of course. And there it is, 2021. The fandom is in full swing today. And also the forthcoming full length collection Common Grace from Beacon Press next year in 2022. Please come back, Erin, and feature on our new book showcase, of course. Erin's poetry has appeared in Beloit Poetry Journal, Poet Lore, DMQ Review, Tool Review, Louisiana Literature, The Night Heron Barks, and elsewhere. Erin earned his MFA in creative writing from Boston University and is a recipient of a Robert Pinsky Global Fellowship in Poetry. 
extraordinary. Would you please welcome Aaron Casado Kimura. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having us here today. I'm very happy to be here and honored to be reading with uh, Sally, Jennifer, and Margo. Uh, before I do read, though, I'd like to say just a little bit about my experience uh, at Slappering Hole Press. My initial experience was actually reading uh, the guidelines for the chapbook competition. I had never heard of Slappering Hall before, but I knew of Jennifer and her poetry. So I was following her on social media. Uh, I didn't know she was a co-editor of the press. And one day uh, she posted this competition. So I thought I, sh I really should check it out because I had a chapbook manuscript and uh, which I was already sending out to many other contests. Uh, now with these guidelines, I noticed right away reading them that they read differently to me. They, they felt different from other guidelines I had come across. Uh, they made me feel um, that the press really cared about this competition and they do and, and really respected the writers who submitted. The guidelines were so clear, so specific, detailed and in large part to ensure uh, the anonymity of the writers. Uh, the guidelines were also very clear that the press followed a certain contest code of ethics. Another thing, the second thing that I noticed about uh, these guidelines uh, about the competition, it has been already mentioned by Jennifer and Margo, and that is that this competition is only for people who have not published a chat book or full length before. But what this told me is that they really really care about helping writers who are just starting out. Uh, even though I'm older, I consider myself a very young writer. I haven't been doing this for long. And a lot of the contests out there are for anyone and everyone at any stage of their careers. Uh, so if you have a chapbook manuscript and have never published a, a, a chapbook or a full length before, I strongly encourage you to submit. And uh, if you win, you get your manuscript published, uh, you get 10 free copies, you'll get an honorarium, uh, you'll get uh, to do a reading at Hudson Valley Writer Center uh, with uh, the mentor of your choice, which is amazing. Um, but also, and they don't tell you this in the guidelines, uh, in addition to all of those other things, you get welcomed into this amazing family of super talented writers. Um, and this was an incredible surprise to me. I started getting uh, Facebook friend requests from all these poets and um, associated with uh, Slappering Hall and the Hudson Valley Writers Center. Uh, and they made me feel so welcomed. And, I, and I'm so grateful for that. And you also uh, get a wonderful experience working with the editors. Big thank you to Margo and Jennifer, who were my editors. Um, it was such an incredible experience working with them on this book. Um, it was also so, so pleasant and so fun. Um, they both have been so, um, they have both have so much experience uh, between the two of them and uh, they continue to be so encouraging and helpful. All that to say, this is an exceptional press. Uh, and again, if you have a chapbook manuscript and have never published a chapbook or full length before, I strongly encourage you to submit to this competition. I am going to read uh, seven poems for you today out of my chapbook. This chapbook is about my parents. Uh, it's, about, it's about their experiences in World War II. Um, it touches on uh, them being newlyweds, of becoming parents, of settling in suburbia. And finally, and mostly, it's about them growing old and passing away. Uh, the title Ubasute is a Japanese word which literally means abandoned. And it refers to a, uh, a mythical practice from Japanese folklore where a son, a grown son, carries his aged parent, father or mother, on his back to a mountain and abandons them, leaves them there to die. Uh, I was a, 
a little boy when my mother told me this horrible tale. And this is the subject of uh, the first poem I'd like to read for you. Uh, this first poem, it's a short poem, and it, it, it's an ekphrastic poem, and it's inspired by a woodblock print, if you could see that. It's inspired by uh, this woodblock print by the master Tsukioka Yoshitoshi. You can see here, I believe, in the corner, the, the son with his mother on his back carrying her up the mountain. And the title of the woodblock print and the title of my poem is The Moon of Ubasute. The Moon of Ubasute after the woodblock by Tsukioka Yoshitoshi. Years from now, when I am old, blind, and crippled, his mother said, you must carry me up the slope of Tanigawa, past the ancient knotted pine, leave me in a cradle of Hakone grass and moss. Without pity, my son, the moon will watch as I reach for my mother, Okasan, Okasan. The ginkgos will bow, weep their leaves, bury me in gold. Uh, my next poem is a pantoum and it's called Burial. I return my father's body to the earth, cremated as he instructed in a letter. No funeral, no obituary in the newspaper. Those who needed to know were told. I had his remains cremated as he instructed, scattered his ashes in Bodega Bay. Those who needed to know were told that I waited until my mother passed to scatter his ashes in Bodega Bay, past the jetty where we used to fish. I waited until my mother passed, poured out their dust together, past the jetty where we used to fish from the deck of the Missanita, seagulls calling overhead. I poured out their dust together with a handful of Uncle George from the deck of the Missanita, seagulls calling overhead. No funeral, no obituary in the newspaper. With a handful of Uncle George, I returned their bodies to the earth. My next poem is about uh, my parents uh, when they first got married before my sister and I came along. And this poem is called The Hardest Part. The fire truck siren downstairs raided the air of my mother's dreams. She'd scream in her sleep, my father told me, even after we married. More than a decade past the Second World War, for him, American concentration camps, for her, the firebombing of Tokyo, they moved into a San Francisco apartment that rented to Japs, a one-bedroom walk-up above the Post Street fire station. They painted their bathroom black. It was in style then. Shelved books, unboxed a new rice cooker, watered a shrub of Japanese maple, potted for their future garden. When the station got a call in the middle of the night, the rumble of the overhead door crumbled into the wreck that was once her home. Swirling lights flashed ancient trees into flames through the thin silk curtains of her eyelids. No warning, no drill, no cover. My father stilled her body 
his broad hand on her shoulder or hip as they lay in the dark, listening to the slowing of her breath. The hardest part of those nights, he said, was waiting, sometimes hours, for the truck and the men to come back. The title of my next poem is uh, actually my mother's name. Uh, her name was Hama. It's a Japanese name and it's spelled H-A-M-A, -A. Hama. I ease a pen into the curl of mom's hand, ask her to sign a check. She sits on the edge of her bed, barely lucid, slowly forms H, A, a faint blue ballpoint cursive, a ripple, an echo, H, A, again, her hand can't write what comes next. Her name is Japanese for beach, I say, it's okay, help her lie back, wonder as her eyes close if her memory washes ashore somewhere. Goat Rock, Doran Park, bright and blustery where with bare feet, pant legs rolled up, she watches I don't toddle too far into the surf. My next poem is called Memorial. Straight as steel, hands on hips, dad balances like a hood ornament on Irving Wasserman's head. He stands feet shoulder width apart, arms stretched out wide. A towel turban cushions his scalp. On the San Francisco Marina Green, sunbathers pay no attention to the two college gymnasts in tight swim trunks. The black and white image is attached to an email Irv sent this morning. He says he lost contact after my parents married 60 years ago, would like to reconnect. He doesn't know he's seven years too late. No online obit found me through my website. He calls my father remarkable, a word I never heard used to describe him. But yes, look, there he is, poised in the air, the husband who never cheated, the father who never struck me. I have two poems for you, left for you today. And this next one is called Owl. Morning ghost, white burnt umber. I heard your hoot in my sleep. You sweep across the road, talon of vole at the oak's foot. Night eyes stare back. Bronze beak tears open the dawn. Caught in sunrise, you dissolve into shadow. I walk the long driveway from the mailbox, riffle through yesterday's junk, open a land's end catalog. There's my mother's white wool sweater. She gets more mail than I do, though she's never lived here and is long gone. Thank you once again, everyone, for coming out to hear us read today. And um, my last poem, the title of this poem is Afternoon Infusion. She panics three hellos as if startled by the noise of an empty house. Calls from St. Joseph's 
the nurses are slow to start her hydration. I'm at a bar. Stevie Nicks reverbs in my beer, lures me back to the edge of 17 in this town I left 30 years ago. I take her call outside, stand away from the smokers. Half truth, I'm at the mall. She slurs a request, milk of magnesia. And that other thing she can't remember. But I remember when I was a boy, she told me about the mythical Japanese custom, ubasute. A grown son lifts his aged mother on his back, delivers her to a mountain, leaves her to die. I'll come pick you up after chemo, I say, and hang up, realizing she's already cradled by the mountain. The waft of cigarette smoke and hint of manure in Santa Rosa air usher me back into the restaurant. The hostess smiles, welcomes me. Clueless, I have come and gone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much for starting us off with such just a moving, lyrical, beautiful reading. Aaron Casado. Aaron, Aaron Casado Kimura, beautiful. The, the chat book is Uba Sute, of course, from Slapring Hall Press. Well, get ready to be mailing some of those out this week. <laughs> and of course, congratulations on your forthcoming book from Beacon Press. And I mean, it really do come back with us and uh, read with us from uh, your new collection. Well, we move on now to another Luminary in the catalog from Slappering Hall Press. Sally Volumus Dunn teaches modern poetry at Manhattanville College and the Palm Beach Poetry Festival. Her poems appeared in New Ohio Review, Plume, Paris Review, Prairie Schooner, Poetry, Poetry London, The New York Times, PBS NewsHour, Upstreet, The Writer's Almanac, Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, and one of my favorites, being from Nebraska, spending time in Nebraska, Ted Kuzer's column, among many, many others. We just had a Ted Kuzer tribute last uh, two weeks ago. Sally in 2002 was a finalist for the Nimrod Hardiman Pablo Neruda Prize. Sally Villamus Dunn's third full length collection, Echo Location, was published by Plume Editions, Mad Hat Press in March. Echo Location was long listed for the Julie. Souk Award and was a finalist for both the Eric Hoffer Award and Poetry by the Seas Best Book Award. Would you please give a grand welcome to Sally Philomastan? Oh my gosh, thanks so much, Sandra, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you, Margo and Sandra and Don and Jennifer mm -hmm. for inviting me to be part of this amazing reading that's going to launch Aaron's beautiful chapbook into the world. I couldn't believe it when I finally held it in my hands, which wasn't long ago, it was a few days ago. Um, and I opened up, I opened up the envelope and I pulled it out. And my husband, who really doesn't like poetry at all, still love him so much, but 
we part ways in, in that area, said to me, he goes, what is that? That is just, you start to thumb through it. He goes, this is just beautiful. And I feel that way each year, the books get more and more beautiful. There's such care. To, I can say this because I'm kind of a worker bee. I'm not an editor. I, am, I read the slush pile and help weed things out or pass things along. But the care that Jennifer and Margo and Peggy give to these chapbooks is extraordinary. I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to be in a poetry group with Margo and Jennifer. And often there'll be a decision that has to be made about the final, you know, should we use this color? Do you like this background? I mean, every single detail. It's like going through a poem line by line, which we do in our workshop um, pretty rigorously. And I just have such respect for Margo, who had the vision to start this place. I don't, I don't have any other friends with such amazing vision and energy and You've given us all such an amazing community, Margo. Um, I don't know what I would do without it. Um, when I moved to Westchester, it seemed like I'd been placed in the center of the Bermuda Triangle and finding the Hudson Valley Writer Center was just um, really life affirming and deeply meaningful to me. Um, I guess that's all, um, I guess that's all. Anyway, thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm gonna be reading a lot of new poems, but I'm gonna start with an old poem. Um, it's, I, um, each year on 9-11, they read the names on the radio of the people who, um, the people who perished. And so I wrote it then, but I'm reading it in honor of all the folks we've lost to COVID now. It's called Their Names. Like a rain I feel but cannot see the names of the dead falling. Silences I hear between first names, middle, last, are slivers of empty air between lines of rain. I want to be in these tiny silences that cannot hold their deaths but join them to all silence, rests in a piece of music, the quiet beneath a rock, the feather on a crow, beak closed, wings perfectly still. A real bright point uh, during the pandemic and in my life, but especially during the pandemic is my daughter Angie and her husband Brett are quite pregnant. Um, Angie is due mid-May. Um, so I'm going to read three new poems that are for her. Um, after winter solstice. Because you are pregnant, the days grow rounder with light. The long oaks bend towards each other as through a glass orb. Loose blouses like snowdrifts. I wish I had sung to you more when you were inside me and carried you less like the marriage I knew was failing. I wish I could have kept my mind in the same place as my body. This year, the winter will not drag on. I will measure the slowly accruing light and your changing form. Who knows what settles as I watch you slice the peaches? Maybe a future entomologist's fingers are finding their first meticulous rhythm. Maybe the delicate register of your child's voice is gathering its notes. This one's called Kitchen Visit. The purple carrots taste does not live up to its exotic appearance. Handsome is, as handsome does, is what my grandmother would have said, though likely not about a carrot. Dead for 40 years, she arrives this time in her blue print dress with the large front pockets that never served as pockets, though she always let me look inside. Frost laces our front window 
and a single moth blinks like a human eye, the pain of glass between us. The purple carrot on the mm -hmm. counter cannot account for why my grandmother appears, now as a moth on the window, and later as the knitted sweaters folded in my closet, just the way she taught me. First the arms towards the heart, and then the waist folding up to the neck of the sweater. Like the impossible pose in yoga, she is holding for me now, as only a ghost can, and inhabiting my pregnant daughter, herself a yoga teacher. I can sense her there, looking out at me from the womb where her first great-grandchild grows. Um, this next one is, is called Ouija, like Ouija board. It's the last one to Ange. Ouija. We are guided by his movements as though they were a language. My palm beneath your palm along the arc of your pregnant belly. As though my hand were the planchette on a Ouija board. There you say. Is that a foot shifting, an elbow, a knee? Like noticing a flutter in a bay's glassy water and not knowing the cause, seal, fish, school of alewives, or listening to the pattern of rain on a roof, unable to tell which drops are falling from the branches, which from the open sky. Um, I wanted to give a plug for, um, I went to a reading the other night, Naomi Shihab Nye was interviewing Stu Kestenbaum and she mentioned this project that she was doing, it's called Dear Vaccine. And it's this big global poem that anyone can contribute to, poet, non-poet, writer, non-writer. She just wants, um, and, she, and she asked that each of us there kind of give it a little public push. Um, she just wants people to address the vaccine in whatever form they feel comfortable. So I, I took a shot at it. Um, it's brand new, so um, we'll see. Dear vaccine, I am watching the, oh, sorry, dear vaccine, I am watching the nurse lift the small vial of you clear as any cloudless sky. Because we have the cow to thank for your name, dear vaccine, I am picturing four or five red Angus in a long grassed field, unfettered as the few good decisions I have made. The nurse lifts a syringe, then dabs my arm, dear vaccine. And there is one cow in particular standing by the weather-worn post and rail fence, the kind that lined the fields of my childhood. And this bovine's eyes shine like the pond where we dunk ourselves to ease the sweltering days, lying afterwards side by side on the warm granite slab. Dear Vaccine, I'm remembering one afternoon when Lila nearly drowned and father dove in, dove down and pulled her up blued but coughing. And we all cried with the kind of relief we'd never felt before. I watched the nurse, dear Vaccine, and thanked her and thanked her and thanked her once more. Uh, so this next one, um, I think during the pandemic, I've always been feeling very close to the natural world, but I think during the pandemic, that became a much more intense relationship in some way for me, because I wasn't seeing people probably. Um, so this is called Birches. I walk the rough stone driveway, and from their long white trunks, brighter than winter air, I sense their dark eyes watching, motionless, without judgment, as when taking something fully in. I know these eyes are wounds healed over or scars from branches fallen. 
And I know the language between us is untranslatable, but for the entire three mile hike, I sense their eyes behind me, holding me as I might hold an overfull glass of water, meniscus trembling in the white winter sky. As they look with great precision, measure me as I grow smaller by the mailbox, letter in my hand. And though at a great distance, I can feel them taking in the loops and dips in the black script of the address and its return, as I might observe without distinction, the wreaths of moss around their trunks, if I were focusing on something else or everything at once. Um, I'll skip that one. Um, I have three poems left. I have um, one for my mom, one for my dad, both of whom aren't living. Um, so my mother in her last years um, had pretty severe dementia and um, I visited her a lot. So this is about one of those visits. Mother, little stirrings in the dried fallen leaves along the path. As when I speak to my old mother and her eyes widen for a moment, then close. She sits in her chair tweed jacket, ball quaffed, looking as she did in her day, though now someone else must dress her, lift the blouse from the hanger, help her slip it on the way she once did for me, grab the cuff, she'd say, the soft tunnel of sleeve would hold me. Sometimes we sing, she only vaguely mouths the words, though occasionally she'll drift along on a note like a leaf lifted by wind before it stills. If I sit by her on the couch, she'll put her head near mine, my hand in hers. Her body is how she remembers now, the way the growth of a tree, the twists of its branches recall the rain, the snow, the sun. I miss her every day. Um, and this one, I think my two brothers are here somewhere. So um, anyway, uh, this one is called Gray Whale and it's not, um, it's not, a, it's not um, a gray whale. It's, it's, a, it's a type of whale. I didn't know that when I was first reading about them. Gray Whale. When they read the metal tag on her pectoral fin, a surprise of dark Cyrillic letters on this gray whale, who had swum some 14,000 miles, interbraiding continent with continent, self with self. Strange that I think of you now, Father, though you too had lived mostly below a surface, the breadth of which we could not know. Until they read the tag, the cytologists had thought the gray whales off the coast of Baja were of a different species from the ones in Minsk. When I found your lacquer boxes, so small they fit into my hand with their depictions of our home, the pots above the stove, their odd discolorations, the cheerful curtained window that looked out at the pines. I felt sad I had not known your heart would swim such distance for us. You had never shown us one. And how small you had to make yourself to see each scene and paint it. Like an ant stepping carefully along one of those dark passages in its hill of dirt that nobody sees inside. Um, And this is the last poem. Mm -hmm. It's an old one. Um, it's called Crossword. Mm -hmm. The white and black squares promise order in the morning mess of mulling over the latest political morass, what's on sale at Kohl's, the book review. 
each letter shared, which lifts away some sheen of loneliness I can't quite explain. This week, arsenic and forsythia are joined by their eyes like long estranged cousins. And when they ask for the French equivalent of sky, I am back on a wooden chair in Madame Baumelin's eighth grade class, passing a note to David, having no idea as my hand grazes his that he will drown sailing that next summer. I like doing the crossword with my husband. Source of support, three letters. I'm the one who guesses it, glad he doesn't think of bra in this way. The puzzle rests on the counter all week. I like coming back, looking at the same clue I found insolvable the day before, my mind often a mystery to me, turning corners when I sleep or I'm upstairs folding clothes. They get added to pounds. Yesterday, I thought it had to do with money or meat. Now I can see the chain link fence at the local animal shelter. Of course, strays. Thanks so much for, um, for listening. I'm so happy and I can't wait to hear Margo and Jennifer. What an absolutely beautiful reading and you'll see the comments in the chat. Uh, you know, I was just struck by all the honorings, mm. all the varied ways you honored the indiv your individual people in your family. But starting out with that poem, Their Names, mm. um, just kind of struck a chord with me. I'm, a, I'm what's considered a titaniac. I'm obsessed with the Titanic. Oh. And today actually marks the hundredth anniversary that the Titan that the Carpathia arrived in New York Harbor hmm. with the survivors from the Titanic, and and uh, I've been at ceremonies where they've read all the names of those who perished, and I I you know I'm I'm this is a week where I think a lot about that disaster and the different iterations of the day from the glorious day it set sail out of Southampton, going to Cherbourg, going to um, Queenstown, which is now Cove, Ireland. And of course, being in the, the, the middle of the Atlantic on that fateful night of April 14th, but a lot of people don't think about the aftermath. And I, I think about that day and to be with so many people here today that spend time um, in that area of New York City and the, the Hudson Valley. I was really thinking about the Carpathia coming in on a very rainy night in New York Harbor mm. to deposit first the lifeboats from Titanic, the empty lifeboats and then going back to Cunard's birth to disembark all the passengers from the Carpathia, including those on, from the Titanic. And so you, your poem, their names really struck a deep, deep chord with me. I thank you for what a beautiful reading that went from that sublime to the really deep place of, of, of honoring your family. What a really stunning reading. Thank you. <laughs> Sally Billamus Dean. And um, we move next to really, you've heard how visionary that Margot Taft Stewart has been in her career. And all that has emerged. All that has emerged um, through the three decades of that work, which of course happened before the work happened. It was, you know, in place before that. You had to envision it before you could enact it. So it's been longer than the 31 years. Um, and it is a, a, a real, a, a true, 
deep pleasure of mine to be able to share Margot Taft's Deaver's biography with you today and to hear her work. Well, Margot Taft Stevers collections include Cracked Piano from Cavan Carey Press 2019, Ghost Moose from Cattywampus Press 2019, and perhaps one of my honestly favorite titles of a book ever, The Lunatic Ball from 2015. And I heard you read from that the other week and I, I, extraordinary, I love that poem. The Hudson Line from 2012, Frozen Spring from 2002, and Reading the Night Sky from 1996. Obviously her poems have appeared widely. In Verse Daily, Plume, Prairie Schooner, Connecticut Review, Up Street, and Salamander, among many others. She is the founder of the Hudson Valley Writers Center and founding and current co-editor of this wonderful press that you've been hearing from today, Slappering Hall Press. She lives in Sleepy Hollow, New York. Would you please welcome Margot Taft Stever? Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Sandy. And thank you for your fantastic reading series. And also, in case you don't want to know, this lighthouse is actually in Sleepy Hollow near the Hudson Valley Writers Center. And I hope everyone will come and visit the Writers Center and attend our readings and workshops when we open, which will hopefully be soon. Who knows, but hopefully soon. And um, also, San I wanted to thank Sally and Aaron for your wonderful readings. I'm going to read um, a poem from my first book, Frozen Spring. Um, <clears throat> And also, there's, I have a poem about Sandy about the Titanic in this book, and I'm going to send it to you. But the poem that I'm reading refers to Victor Hara, who, um, and refers to Chilean songs of revolution. And he was a great singer songwriter who lived from 1932 to 73. And he was rounded up in the stadium, now renamed the Victor Hara Stadium where soldiers crushed his fingers with the butts of their rifles after he was playing the guitar and murdered him only days after the coup that brought Pinochet to power. This begins with an epigraph by Bertolt Brecht. Conversation with Bertolt Brecht. Solely because of the increasing disorder in our cities of class struggle, some of us have now decided to speak no more of cities by the sea snow on roofs, women. As if the Chilean songs of revolution would bring back the gray fishing boats sailing through frail deepening waters at dawn and the seagulls making earthly sounds. As if these songs could restore the balance, the driven leaf, nail old and rusted, shoved through the bent bough. Each step through mirrors brings us back to the pitch of sleeplessness, the unstrung dream, an oil slick on an ocean still and black. As if all the songs of revolution could bring the murmuring tree back, could restore wind to the rigging, full sail to the morning light. How many years, messages, wars, strange incidences, ironies, the wary eye of the mother wanted to protect her child, promise more, cities near the sea, clear waters, full sail, the morning light. Next, I'd like to read a few poems from Crack Piano that Sandy mentioned, which was published by Calvin Carey Press in 2019. And um, I'm going to read The Lunatic Ball. Uh, in the latter half of the 19th century as part of a humanistic movement in the treatment of mental patients, hospital superintendents held balls for their patients sometimes, and spectators also were sometimes invited. This was inspired also by the painting by George Bellows, after, which is titled Dance in the Madhouse. He lived from 
1882 to 1925. The lunatic ball. Furious dancing gives way to screams. Five men stare ghoulish at the wall. This is a lunatic ball. The best student Yale had ever seen. Three months after graduation, typhoid. Brain swelled inside his skull. They dosed out calomel. Five ghosts appeared in a mercury dream. Headaches unbearable. This is a lunatic ball. Married one year, baby the next. His wife filed for release. The medical textbooks he gleaned, futile, endless stall. A woman names her baby doll Christ, lurches, leans, a building in an earthquake, then she crawls. This is a lunatic ball. One man plays a flute, calls himself Faunus. Another uses an invisible latrine. Attendants haul out a wild man on a straitjacket, on a wooden beam. A woman growls like a bear. This is a lunatic ball. Behind a glass wall, well-dressed spectators riveted sit amused. Looking at them looking, the patients know they are through. Spec spectacled men sport great coats and laced up women make jokes in the shimmering hall. That's one, one core of the book is kind of like, is about the thin line between sanity and insanity and another one is the mercurial role of mothers and the subjugation of women. This one is titled, Nothing's Holding Up Nothing. El Salvador, 1982. Under the floorboards with the wood rot, the insects, ants skittering to and fro, the mother hides with her child, her nipples in the infant's mouth, but her milk won't let down. She did nothing, but the official suspected, decided to make an example. The child dragged out, beaten, the bellies of flowers blackened, the bells, the bells, the long toll of roots. It is hard to believe anything was ever alive under here, under these boards, anything alive for long under these boards. Filaments break off in powder as if they never were wood as if the hollows were roads going somewhere, as if the mother's breast could fill with milk, as if her child could breathe again. And here's one other mother-related poem titled Bottomland. <clears throat> Evening tidings, the preparations, each nestle, each cheep like chicks calling, the winnowing anomie all come to call too late, come to call for sleep. How a mother can change from angel to sour mud queen of all decay by those who feel this sting, by those who cry out. Flail my heart upon the stone in the grove near the river bank, rushing water to the river break. Even the known becomes unknowable. Their small eyes look at me like chicks gathered against rain, staved. Thin rivulets of fear running away with itself fear, fearful fear. No one can talk to you. No one can listen. No one can touch you. This is not stillness. This is not the keeper of the estuary of the deep. Don't forget me. Don't forget that hill the horses cantered you down to the bottom land. From this stone, ageless heart, remember your mother, a mother who loved her children. And then I, on the same theme, I'm gonna read an elegy for my mother and for nature. My mother is dying. In the place where she belongs, suffering erases itself Doves bring her seeds, horses sleep next to her in the straw. Where she belongs, a welcoming place holds her, keeps her from running away, the green, greenness of the hay turning to gold. Already the rain's restless trajectory, my mother is busy dying. She no longer knows my name. This is the wind of Eden, 
the wand of change, the last slave of silence, the knave of rain, so quiet the roving of each vacant quest. Let her be buried in the sea by the sea berry, the briar rock, the fossil chamber. Alone, blown, roadside stray, the flown restless wayward ringing, bells clang, ocean downcast rolls. Wandering once again, now I return to the center, searching the level earth, calling her name, remembering that I am lost. The path unfurls before my dog and me, walking to the rocks, the ocean on one side, the bay on the other, eiders blessing the waves. The seagull's spontaneous burst, how it hurts with the radio blaring. My mother is dying, gone from a body that has abandoned her. Cry because everything goes haywire, because this is Apollo's siren lyre, the field-worn answer, the childless response, children waiting for some god to bring, her, bring them home. And then I just want to treat a few poems from my chapbook, Ghost Moose, which was also published in 2019. And some of the poems are on the sixth extinction through which we are currently living, one of the greatest in, in the history of the earth and the only one created by humans. But I'll begin with a poem that is not on that topic. Dolls. The dolls wait for the children to wake up. They lie on their backs, staring upwards as though the ceiling were a resting place. For them, love is what counts. Holding them, talking softly, making certain they sleep comfortably in their beds. Knowing how to dress dolls is an art, just what color socks each takes, like pouring tea, how many gowns, where the shoes go. Dressing could take all day or just a second. Dirt sticks to a doll, remember, rain is not right for her. Exposure to the elements breaks down a doll's resistance. Wait until storms abate before leaving with your doll. Time means nothing to her. She will wonder about rain, about everything trains bring. Tree flowers drape light strands like spider babies in soft wind. Dolls are restless on their feet all day, listening for helicopters. They gather on roads after rainfall to smell the concrete getting wet, the newly soaked pavement almost drunk after a dry spell. Dolls on boats head for rocks in high winds. How many times they wish the boat could reverse. But before motors were invented, everyone jumped ship. Each day, supermarket racks sport headlines, dolls gone sour, dolls born with beards, hair grown with snakes, Medusa-like. Not too many years ago, the subtext for the next poem might have seemed implausible. And I think someone mentioned this poem in the chat. End of Horses. I write to you from the end of the time zone. You must realize that nothing survived after the horses were slaughtered. We sleep below the hollow burned out stars. We look into dust bowls searching for horses. When you walk in the country, you will be shocked to meet substantial masses on the road. We do not know whom to accuse or where the horses were driven, who slaughtered them or for what purpose? Had the horses slept under the linden trees? The generals and engineers pucker and snore on the veranda. And I have one more poem. Um, that previous two poems and this one are in my unpublished manuscript, Three, Ra Three Ravens Watch. Ocean birds. Jealous is the night, the feckless night, coming over us as water into sea, the forceful days geography turned black. Your body is the sea I float upon, your skin becomes the waves. Nothing will ever bring you here to me. Nothing will ever call you back. Thank you. Wow, what a reading.
I can't wait to, I, I have to say it. I mean, everybody who knows me knows I'm about to say it. I can't wait to read the Titanic poem, of course. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Margo. Um, honestly, to hear a, a poet of conscience and a person and a poet with an unwavering passion for poetry. Thank what you. a what a what a real gift to all of us here in the audience today. Well, we move from one ex extraordinary visionary human being to another one in Jennifer Franklin. Uh, Jennifer Franklin. has published two full-length collections. Most recently, No Small Gift, four-way books in 2018. And you are, the, you are an exceptional, you, you do what I do all the time. I'm always holding up the books. You take the cake though. You're, you're like way better, like you're right on cue. Uh, I, I might have to have you come to every reading in perpetuity, because you're so good at that. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna start again because it's, Jennifer's bio is worth repeating. Jennifer Franklin has published two full length collections. Most recently, here we go again, No Small Gift, Four Way Books, 2018. And her third book, If Some God Shakes Your House, will be published by Four Way Books in 2023. Her work has been published or is forthcoming in American Poetry Review, Barrow Street, Bennington Review, Blackbird, Boston Review, Broadsided Press, The Gettysburg Review, Guernica, JAMA, Los Angeles Review, Love's Executive Order, the Nation, New England Review, Paris Review, Plume, Poem A Day on poets.org and Prairie Schooner. She holds an AB from Boston University and an MFA from Columbia University where she was the Harvey Baker Fellow. Jennifer currently teaches in Manhattansville's MFA a program. For the past eight years, she has taught manuscript revision at the Hudson Valley Writers Center, where she runs the reading series that everyone can't wait to go to now after today, if they didn't know about it, and also serves as the program director and co-edits Slappering Hall Press. She lives in New York City. Welcome, 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 Jennifer Franklin. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was such a wonderful introduction. It's such an honor to read with these great poets today. And no matter how many times I hear their, their poetry, I just, I, I get goosebumps and I always hear something new. I probably have heard Margo read more than any other poet. Um, and it's just such a thrill to to always read with with you and and Aaron your your chapbook I mean I have to hold it up again because it is true what Sally said they do keep getting more beautiful each year and it doesn't seem possible that that could happen but it really is true and I think Ed was just so inspired by the poems this time that and the and the fact that Aaron picked this artwork he just, he reached a new level with this one. So um, the poems are incredible inside. And of course, Ed Rayer of Swamp Press did a beautiful job um, producing it. So we all had the same reaction Sally had when we got it in the mail. The texture of the paper, you can't see it on Zoom, is just stunning. So please do get Aaron's chapbook if you haven't already purchased it. He had more pre-orders than anyone else ever in the time of the press. 
So congratulations, Aaron. People, I don't know if you've seen this on Facebook, but people are doing mini reviews of his poem. Someone read Owl. Uh, people are taking pictures of it with tulips and lavender. So the book is really a buzz on, on Facebook. So congratulations, Aaron. We're really, really proud of you. Um, you know, we can't take that much credit for it because it came fully formed. It's probably the one that Margot and I had the least editorial suggestions for of all of the books. So um, thank you for saying so many great things about the press, Aaron. And Sally and Margot, it was great to hear your poems. And Sally, especially nice to hear your new daughter poems next to your your mother poems. It was beautiful to hear them together because I've heard them separately and now hearing them together, it's really great. And Margot, I can't wait until your new book comes out. Um, so I'm gonna read a few new poems um, that are in the new book that uh, Sandy talked about, If Some God Shakes Your House, and a couple of the old poems from, from No Small Gift. Um, what, before I start, Sandy, you'll like this, the a Titanic story for you. I live right next to the little park where there's a Titanic memorial. You probably know about it at 106th Street um, and Broadway. It's, uh, it's a little park and it has a sculpture um, and it's for the couple who died you know, together, um, Ida, yeah, Strauss, exactly. And I'll send you some pictures I just took with all the tulips in bloom. So, um, so we will we will continue the Titanic. Uh, I don't have any Titanic poems, or I, I would read one for you, Sandy. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read today is um, is called uh, "One Photograph" because I've been reading so much about um, anti-Semitic. Um, hate crimes in America lately. And I just saw a headline right before I came to this reading from the New Yorker about how a couple is moving to Berlin because it's deemed safer now for Jewish people than, than America. So um, this is a, a poem that I wrote in response to one photograph in Anne Weiss's book, um, that was published by Norton several years ago called The Last Album, Eyes from the Ashes of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And it's a beautiful book. People risked their lives burying the photographs that came in from this very last um, transport. And, um, and they weren't found and published until 19, around 1986. And, um, Anne has dedicated her life since then to find the relatives of the people in this book, in these photographs. And many of them have been found, but many of them, we have no idea who they are. And this particular picture of a mother and a daughter, um, no one knows you know, who they are. No one has come forward to identify the two of them. So it just, it kills me you know, that, that, um, that this is the case and of course, everything that happened to them. Um, but this is called One Photograph. They hold nothing but each other, fixed like this forever, mother and daughter, their love survives, testament to life before God's great silence. No one alive knows their names or will. Maybe it is wrong for me to mourn them but I put what remains in a small pewter frame next to my dead grandmother and her sisters. When you rest your hands on my shoulders, I think of them, the mother in her housecoat, blossoming roses, the girl in her swimsuit, tummy round and innocent. In the cold cattle car, they had no nest but each other. Human cries around them drowned out owls in autumn smothered everything but the stars that watched them suffer. I hope they were together when they died, that their eyes were the last of what they saw in this fallen world. Even in the thick darkness of my living room, I see them embracing, always almost kissing. Um, this poem is, um, 
to continue this theme of prejudice and, and hatred and, and murder. Um, this is a new poem from my forthcoming collection and it's a prose poem. And I wrote a lot of these prose poems um, during the time of the, the last administration. This is called May. America's new disease and old disease keep killing. The names of the dead fill the newspapers. Only some of us are safe. This country was stolen, built on blood and lies. History is not the past. On the news, the president denies everything we know to be true. Orwell wrote, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. In a slanted room, the stone-hearted judge plots with the single-minded precision of a serial killer. White candles burn down to the wick and the succulents need to be replanted. Since you can't sleep, read about exploding stars and supernovas that scatter the calcium of all human bones and teeth and how Stephen Hawking's proved there is no God. My friend's son asks, whenever he hears sirens, if cops are coming to kill him. My daughter's brain is stuck at 20 months, trapped in her body of 19 years. She doesn't yet know about hatred, but someday her silence will destroy her. We cannot be saved, but I wish some God would save them. The cherry trees are about to flower. The buds are small, bloody fists. And this is a lighter poem um, from my new collection. Um, I was really excited because it was chosen to be on the buses um, in Providence where, um, where I went to college. So um, this one was on the bus all of February. Um, thanks to Tina Kane. It's called Memento Mori Pistachios. I never know I'm an animal more than when I shell pistachios in the kitchen after washing ditch dishes, waiting for you to come home. I know how I must look, cracking the tight shells, popping the small green nut into my open mouth again and again. I never knew your trick to pry a stubborn shell slit not wide enough to open. You showed me how to place half a discarded shell in the small opening like a tool. It frightens me, my new resourcefulness, my hunger, the way I wait for you as if I will never have enough. And this next poem is, um, it was published in uh, the Night Heron Barks and they nominated for it for a Pushcart Prize, which was my first nomination. I know a lot of people have been nominated for them, but I had never, so this was exciting for me. Um, it's, I have three types of poems in the new collection. There are the prose poems that you heard one of, there are the memento mori poems, and then the third element braided in is poems about a contemporary Antigone. Um, and this one is called Antigone Visits the Psychiatric Hospital. The guard confiscates the small spiral bound notebook I bought her at the dollar store. The pink plastic cord could be pulled from the pages and used to injure herself, he explains, as if I should have known not to bring it. Magazines with smiling women in swimsuits are sanctioned as if they will teach her how to look happy. The music I transfer to a small silver device makes it in but does not please her. Vacant, she gazes past me, her thick hair twisted in a bun. She is more beautiful than she was at her wedding. She begs me to get her out of the locked ward, says she cannot sleep one more night in this place. The doctor asks if I brought a word search, as if finding nouns in a field of scattered letters could fix this. How can I tell her I know the corners of chaos where her mind has lured and trapped her. 
How can I unpeel myself from this vinyl love seat and leave her with leering nurses and patients? How can I turn around and press the buzzer for the guard to open the door and let me walk out again into the strange July sun? This one is, thank you. This one is another Antigone poem. Um, it's a, a poem about her uncle, uh, Creon, who sentences her to death. Creon creates his own truth. It took me years to see the chaos he wanted to create. He brought blight to the roses and cut them back to claim the cure. All summer, he set small fires with words, but kept his hands clean. He turned us against each other as if we were all invasive species in his groomed garden. As we sat under the golden rain tree, I worried the sliver of moon would incur his wrath for its imperfection. Fear is an addictive drug. When he fits his tight fist around my throat now, I hear his lies as lies. My crime is thinking for myself. Hannah Arndt believed forgiveness is the key to freedom. I cannot agree. And um, I'm gonna read just a couple more poems. Um, this one is um, a pantoum, like Aaron had a pantoum for you before. And it's, um, it was inspired because I read a pantoum that Allison Joseph had um, in the New York Times. And it's, um, I, I got good news this week that I'm still in remission. So I'm very relieved and I'm, I'm reading my biopsy pantoum poem. I am waiting for biopsy results again in the mirrored room where time stalls, knowing women are always at the mercy of men even after I get the results, it will feel like my fault. In the mirrored room where time stalls, I stare at the same insipid face. Even after I get the results, it will feel like my fault. I walk with treadmill, regretting what I can't erase. I stare at the same insipid face. The longer I carry my body, the harder it is to tend. I walk with treadmill, regretting what I can't erase. Until I die, this worry will never end. The longer I carry my body, the harder it is to tend. Knowing women are always at the mercy of men. Until I die, this worry will not end. I am waiting for biopsy results again. And I'm going to end um, with this prose poem. Um, this was written at the very beginning of the pandemic when we, we thought we might all have COVID. Um, we had fevers. I had a very bad cough. It was scary because all night you'd hear the ambulances going to the hospital. Um, so we've kind of gotten a lot out of it, but not fully. And so many people have died from this, as you know. So it's kind of um, a tribute to that beginning when we didn't know what was going to happen at all and it's called March. The three of us have seen only each other for 11 days. Our fevers are low grade and only one of us coughs through the night. Under each window, the city is empty as the moon. Sirens startle the bruised sky and my father-in-law still doesn't believe we're in danger. From Sappho's work, we have fragments. What cannot be said will be wept. Imagine if we could behold her whole. The doctor upstairs cannot calm her children when they trample the wooden floors. It sounds as if they're hammering coffins. News, news, charts, news. My mother sends photographs of her pear trees. Subject line, nothing can stop spring. I've started bargaining. Oh, the things I have given up in the crook of night. The books beg to be opened one last time. Sappho wrote, someone I tell you in another time will remember us. For 15 years, the plague doctor's beaked mask from Venice hung on my wall. I try to sleep, 
while two inhalers and a stack of books perch beside me. Headlines praise plague time productivity of Shakespeare between articles on job loss, exploitation of essential workers, and the death count. My students flatten to faces on a screen. I scroll past memes of Dickinson as saint of social distancing and unfriend everyone who claims we should not stay inside. Two drinks in, my brother texts with grim predictions while I try to read 12 pages of War and Peace for an online book club sprung up overnight. Musicians play to an empty theater. Two kinds of cancer continue to grow in my father, his surgery suspended while they ready the hospital for hundreds of patients who can't breathe. Like a spell, I write a list of everyone I want to save and repeat their names while the dog sleeps beside me. I start and end with you. It is already morning in Italy. Quarantined neighbors sing to each other from open windows. Swans swim the Venice canals. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for Sandy for being such an amazing literary citizen. Thank you, Margot. You're the whole reason why we're all here with Sopring Hall Press, the Hudson Valley Writer Center. None of this community that we all are so grateful for would be possible without you and your enduring commitment. Someone said your, your persistent power, uh, passion for poetry or something like that. I mean, it's, it's really true. The, the unwavering dedication to it is kind of astonishing after all this time. So thank you all for having us, for being here and um, for your wonderful work. <laughs> Don't forget to uh, check out our reading series and all of the, the chat books online in our bookstore for Sopring Hall Press. This is our little um, pamphlet that we send out when you order chat books. I thank you first, Jennifer, for your reading, which was breathtaking. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of speechless and which is the best thing for me to be <laughs> Thank after you so much, a poetry Andy. reading. Um, before I make some final kind of announcements about things and kind of wrap up for today. I mean, first of all, I'm sure that all of us would be all too happy to do another round, like to do the reading all over again. You know, like, oh my gosh, I, I, I'd be like, oh my gosh, let's just, let's just, let's just go back to the, let's just do it again. Such incredible work. I'd like to invite the audience here in Zoom, if they would, if you care to, to um, unmute yourselves and, and really, uh, you know, give Aaron, Sally, Margo, and Jennifer um, your, rousing, rousing appreciation. Rousing. Yay! Oh, oh, fabulous. Wow. Oh, oh my God. Oh, right, right, right. Right, Kate. Wonderful. Like, wow. Big love. Wow. Wonderful. Big love. Wow. Big love. Amazing. Woo. Carolyn, hello. Hello, yeah. good to see hey, everybody. Carolyn. Good to see everybody. Susanna, Sandy. <laughs> Sandra. Susanna, yeah. I don't know who Lots all's in the room. Great. <laughs> You are yeah. all endeared to us at Cultivating Voices so deeply. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. Oh, thank you. Thanks for this amazing opportunity yeah. for us to read, oh, talk about the press. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm, we're very, very happy to have <laughs> launched you here on, uh, you know, had a little launch party here for um, for really a poetry, you know, a pillar, a pillar of poetry. Uh, that there's my word, it's a pillar of poetry, long standing. Um, I normally encourage you all to please purchase at least one, but how could you possibly choose just one after 
everything that you've heard today. So I really do hope that if you have the resources, you will um, support Slappering Hall Press uh, today and in perpetuity. Well, again, congratulations, um, Aaron Casado Kimura, Sally Villamus Dunn, Margot Taps, Stever, and Jennifer Franklin for a very, very memorable and, and, and incredibly moving reading today with the stunning work from Slappering Hall Press. Of course, during Poetry Month. It seems really appropriate that we would be able to feature you all during Poetry Month. I mean, to me, poetry is every day. Margot, of course, same for you. But, uh, and for most of us that are here, honestly, you know, we live, breathe, sleep poetry. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, Poetry Month. Well, we have many more special events coming up during the month of April here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, of course. So I just want to tell you before our upcoming events, just a few events that I'm hope that I'm personally hoping to attend this week. You know, um, on uh, Tuesday, Jessica Jacobs and Nicole Brown will be hosting a generative workshop um, with with their rather new endeavor called Sun June. Look that up and see if you can register for that on Tuesday evening. Um, the Olympia Poetry Network, which was the co, uh, our co-co-spirator, that's what I call uh, collaborators, co-co-spirators of the Laureate Love Fest that we held in February, will be featuring its annual Dead Poets Reading on Wednesday night. And on Thursday in Limerick, I try never to miss, um, head over on over to Ireland for Lime Square with your host Dorsefer and Lauren Donovan. And on Saturday the 24th, you can listen to some really amazing poets at the New Mexico State Poetry Society's annual um, conference festival featuring some of some names you'll recognize from our membership here in Cultivating Voices, um, including Amit Dahiyabacha, Mary Owishi, current Poet Laureate of Albuquerque, and many other New Mexico Poet Laureates. And I am very, very honored to be able to join them. Uh, what a better way for me to spend my birthday than in New Mexico reading poetry. So, and then, of course, we return on Sunday. Every Sunday, we're here for our new books showcase featuring next week Patricia Clark, Seymour Maine, Elaine Nadal, and Leslea Newman. All of our readings are curated with poetry love and the love of poetry. And we are holding a very special event on Tuesday. April 27th, which is born 100% out of love. We will be gathering to uh, remember the poet and the poetry of Ivan Boland with four special guests who knew her in various capacities. Um, we will be uh, hosting Catherine Ann Cullen, who is the inaugural poet in residence at Poetry Ireland. Jesse Lendeni, the founder and managing editor of Salmon Poetry, celebrating its 40th year this year. Um, Nessa O'Mahony, co-author of the, the um, critically acclaimed um, book about Evan's work, Evan Boland, Inside History. And Rachel Hegarty, an auth the author of May Day, 1974. Um, Rachel and Catherine were students of Ivan's um, at Trinity College. Um, they will all be speaking about their connections with Ivan and reading her and reading her poetry. And all of you are welcome to attend and read your favorite Boland poem in our open mic or a poem 
you may have written a poem that was inspired by her. So we welcome you to join us in the open mic um, after our guests. And on May, on May 2nd, join our guest host, Angela Dribben, for our Poets Focus on May Day with features Margaret O'Regan, Tim Evans, Rachel Hegarty will be joining us again, Dana Patterson, and your chance also to join us on May Day um, on the open mic. And on May 16th, my final uh, announcement for today, please join us for our focus on witness. We will have three generations of Asian American women poets in conversation with each other, including Janet, Janice uh, Kirikatani, Mary Awishi, and Tanya Ko Hong. That will be Sunday, May 16th. Well, you can register for all of our um, readings on the events pages for each of the readings. And of course, you can join us live in Zoom if you do that registration and watch live on Facebook, of course, as we used to do in the old, back in the old days last March. Well, I want to thank you all for really, uh, I'm astounded by the reading today and I'm astounded most Sundays. And uh, thank you for joining uh, me and thank you for joining all of us together here in Zoom. Thanks to Don Krieger, of course. I say it every week, but the thanks does not diminish at all. In fact, it increases. Don Krieger, poet, timekeeper, technical wizard, and to Kim Ports Parsons, who is our, our, the, vi the visuals of Cultivating Voices, creating um, our beautiful visuals for our series. And of course, to, my, to the co-founder, Elizabeth Ann, my sister, I wanna send um, a lot of peace out to all of you from wherever you are joining us today. And until we meet up again, I bid you ahoy, safe travels, and of course, keep writing. And buy those chapbooks from Slappering Hall Press. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>